Welcome to our second session, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, so, as you're as you're aware, uh, ICAP recently signed MOU with uh, CPA Canada, uh, which is representing all the provincial and territorial uh, institutes. Uh, so, under the uh, new MOU, um, ICAP members can write CFE directly without going through um, writing capstone one, two, and other requirements. Uh, however, um, because our examination system in Pakistan and here in Canada is different, uh, so um, it is advisable or actually recommended to go through some sort of practice for the CFE. So there are different routes that you can use. Uh, so you can go through the whole process, uh, write uh, uh, all the exams and uh, like capstone one, two, and everything. Or uh, you can go through uh, and prepare yourself through one of the accounting schools, like uh, Pass Accounting School or Densmore or any other. Uh, so the purpose of this session is, uh, you remember we, uh, we uh, held a session with the CP Ontario, uh, I think in uh, April, May, I think. Uh, so where uh, CP Ontario went through what are the, what are the requirements to register for as a candidate for examinations. So as part of that, um, uh, we're lucky to have uh, uh, Michael Levy and uh, Ira Walfish from PASS. They'll uh, present uh, on the tips on how to write uh, CFE examinations. Uh, and they'll be here to answer your questions as well. Uh, so uh, we should take advantage of this and then you can make a decision whether you want to register with them or someone else or write the whole capstone one and two, whatever. But uh, my uh, advice or recommendation would be to, you should have some sort of preparation and good preparation. So this is one of the, one of that uh, option to prepare. To, so, without further ado, I would hand over the mic to Michael. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to start by thanking um, Shamshad and ICAP for inviting us to speak. It's uh, certainly a privilege for us to have the opportunity to present to you. Um, let me explain what we'd like to cover over the course of our short microphone. Sorry, we can't hear? Let me explain what I'd like to cover. Can you hear, hear me better now? Over the course, yeah. Can I adjust the mic? Maybe if some of you can uh, come forward. There are uh, well, so you know what, spaces here. The mic is not really open. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah, you have okay. to okay. hold it. Sure, sure, sure. No problem. <laughs> no problem. So let me ex I'll just wait for people to move. <clears throat> I'm sorry? The screen is not big enough. The screen is not big enough. Um, Okay. Um, if we can just move back the table, that will make it bigger. Yeah. And what we can do, if we move back the table, that, that would do it. There's still some more chairs in the front, if you guys can move up a little bit. So what I'd like to discuss is what we'll be covering during our short presentation. Um, I'm going to be doing a portion of the presentation, and my partner, Ira Walpush, will be doing another portion of it. The whole presentation shouldn't take us more than a half hour, it may even take us less. Let me explain what I'd like to cover, and then I would welcome any questions. Please feel free to ask questions either while I'm speaking or when I'm finished. Either is fine. You don't have to wait till I'm finished. If any questions come up as I go along, please feel free to ask. It's not a huge group here, so we can keep it, you know, fairly informal. I'd like to start off with, by explaining the session purpose. We'll explain that in just a moment. We'll then take a bird's eye view of the CPA program. We'll take a close look at Capstone 1 and Capstone 2, which you're all aware you're encouraged to do, although you're not required to do it. And then we'll also take a close look at what the CP entails. 
and then we'll speak for just a moment about experience requirements. I'll be doing part one. My partner, Ira, will then move into part two. In part two of the presentation, we'll explain to you a little bit about who we are, who PASS is. We've been around for a very long time, and we'll tell you a little bit about ourselves. We've also developed a program specifically for international CAs. So that would be for Indian CAs, Pakistani CAs, and CAs from all over the world. And it's catered specifically to their needs, uh, which I think is somewhat unique. And Ira will tell you more about that. And then finally, we'll deal with registration information in case people are interested in registering. So let's start with the purpose of the session. The purpose of this session is really to acquaint you, sorry, the purpose of the session is to acquaint you with the CV that I imagine most of you are planning to write and to discuss with you what exactly is involved in preparing for the CV. We'll also take a quick look at the experience requirements, which again, I think are pretty straightforward. Once you have the knowledge which we're going to be conveying to you over the next few minutes, you'll be able to make an informed decision with regard to how to attack these exams. And then finally, I will, as I said before, we'll acquaint you with a program that we designed specifically with people like yourselves in mind. So let's start with a bird's eye view of the program. I'm not going to be going through this, this, through this slide in detail, so please don't worry about the fact that you can't read this. It doesn't really matter. It really doesn't matter. I'm not going to be going through this detail. Let me give you a bird's eye view of what the program looks like for an average Canadian student who is going to be writing the CP. Then I can show you the portions of the program that you're exempt from. So first let me give you the big picture, and then we can relate it back to the Pakistan, to a CA from Pakistan. Basically, a typical Canadian student would have to first do two modules, Core 1 and Core 2. Core 1 is a module that focuses primarily on financial accounting. Core 2 is a module that focuses primarily on management accounting. So the purpose of Core 1 and Core 2 is to make sure that everybody gets a good grounding in the two biggest parts of the exam, which are management accounting and financial account. Those are the biggest parts of the CV. Then everybody from Canada would then be asked to write two electives, and they would choose from among four. There are four possible electives, elective modules they would have to do, and the four topics are assurance, performance management, tax, and finance. An average student would choose from among two out of four of those electives. If you want to get your public accountant's license, you would have to choose assurance and tax. If you don't care about getting your public accountant's license, you just want your CPA, an average Canadian student could choose any of the four. They would then move on to capstone one, which is basically, which I'll talk about in a little more detail in just a moment. They then move on to capstone two, and then finally the CV. So now let's try to relate it to people like yourselves. Pakistani CAs are exempt from Core 1 and Core 2, as well as the electives. So I want to make it clear, you don't have to take these modules or write these exams, but you are expected to have the knowledge that you would normally need to pass these exams. The assumption is you have the knowledge already or you'll acquire the knowledge in some way. So please understand that you're exempt from the exams, but, you're not, but obviously that knowledge base is still very critical. Now, you're not required, as Shamshak pointed out, you're not required to do either Capstone 1 or Capstone 2, but CPA Canada strongly recommends that you do it. The reason why they recommend that you do it is Capstone 1 basically is intended to prepare you for the first day of the CP. The first day of the CP focuses on the same case that you work on as part of the Capstone 1 module. So it makes it much more difficult to write the first day of the CP if you haven't done the module when most of the people you're competing with have done the module. Right? Most groups have to do Capstone 1. This is a unique situation that CAs from Pakistan do not have to. Most, the vast majority, probably you know, 95% of the people or more writing will have done Capstone 1 module. So you might be at somewhat of a disadvantage if you haven't done it since it does relate back to the first day of the CP. Capstone 2, again, it would be to your detriment not to do it because Capstone 2, all you're really doing is writing practice cases which are basically marked professionally and it's really giving you a chance to practice for the CP. Most of what you'll be writing as, as, as practice exams for Capstone 2 will be old CPs, prior CPs. So why, why not take the opportunity to write these practice cases? 
you don't need to pass capstone two. There's no final exam. All it really is doing is helping you prepare for the CV. So although you're exempt from doing it, I'm not sure what you would gain by not doing it. Right. It's just an opportunity to help you. It's not meant to weed people out. Nobody gets weeded out of Capstone 2. As long as you write the cases, it doesn't matter how well you do, you'll get through Capstone 2. What you do, of course, have to write is the CT itself, which in 2018 is going to be written in September 12th to the 14th. How much, just out of curiosity, how many of you are planning to write in 2018? Okay, so among a lot of you. Well, I never had musical accompaniment to my lecture before. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is a privilege. Okay. Let me now just give you a brief overview of Capstone 1, Capstone 2, and most importantly, the CP itself. The main focus of Capstone 1 is a big business case that you work on as part of a group. So you'll be paired up with a number of other students, and you'll work on this case together. And as I mentioned before, it's intended to prepare you for the first day of the CP. The first day of the CP is one big case, a four-hour case, which will be based on the same company that you're working on as part of your Capstone 1 module. And I listed for you the key aspects of Capstone 1. Number one, you end up as a group, you would write a big report that basically is it's intended to be a simulation of a type of report that you will be doing for a board of directors or senior executives. Capstone 1 is not intended to be a very technical module. It's not testing your technical knowledge of accounting or your technical knowledge of tax, etc. It's meant to be dealing with big picture strategic business type issues. So you're working on a big strategic case and you're doing a simulated presentation. You're writing up a presentation that would be given in real life at a very high level within the company to a board of directors or a team of senior executives. In addition to writing this written report, you also do an oral presentation to the simulated board or board or team of senior executives, and then there's a question period in which the simulated board or executives can, can basically question you. Now, the way it's structured is Capstone 2 starts with a two-day weekend walk workshop. And I've explained over here what you would do. You would meet the other members of your team, you'd learn about presentation skills, and you'd come up with an overall action plan. It is somewhat time consuming. I'd be, argue, I'd be lying to you if I said it wasn't. And our students tell us that it usually takes about 10 to 15 hours a week of work. It's not very difficult work, but it certainly is, time, is somewhat time consuming. And then, as I say, you're, you're not really submitting anything on your own. Everything is being done as part of a group. Now, generally speaking, you're rated as a group. The only way an individual could fail Capstone 1 would be if the person wasn't pulling their weight and other members of the group felt that that individual should not, should not pass. I've never heard of that happening, quite honestly. The vast, vast majority of people pass Capstone 1. I think to fail Capstone 1 would require some effort. Because the bottom <laughs> line is that it's not meant to fail people. The only way to not pass Capstone 1, frankly, is to not do what they tell you to do. Because the way it works is you make submissions, interim submissions. If something is deficient, they will tell you to correct it. As long as you correct it, you will pass. So they're not trying to weed people out. Most of the weeding out takes place when people do core one, core two, and the electives from which you've been exempt. That's where all the weeding out takes place. Once people make it through the electives, as long as they do what they're supposed to do, they should make it through. Michael. Yes. So you say the average candidate needs 10 to 15 hours a week. For how many weeks? It's about, it starts in mid-May and it goes into July. Uh, so it's from mid-May until well into July. Is it about seven weeks on it, I think? Yeah, so it's about it's about seven weeks. I mean, we, we, on our website, I think we have a, do we have the schedule? Um, or you would go to the actually the CPA website would give you the exact schedule, but it's about seven weeks. I think. Yeah, this this year the presentations were around July seven, eight, nine. Each group presents like a different day in that week. And I think it starts about mid May. Is that right? Yeah, it starts around May 14, 15. If so the can... second weekend in May, you have to attend in person a Saturday. I think it's a Saturday, Sunday. A yeah, Saturday, Sunday, two-day session you have to attend in person at a location. Depending on wherever you're writing, there's a whole bunch of different locations throughout the province, throughout all the provinces. Right. So you've basically got the second half of May, June, and a bit of July. 
Any other questions on Capstone 1? Okay. Then you've got Capstone 2. Capstone 2 has three primary objectives. Number one, to help you develop your enabling competencies. Your enabling competencies are your soft skills that will enable you to write cases effectively. And it's really preparing you for all three days of the CP. Because in a moment, I'll describe the CP to you. There are three days to it. What they do is they give you the opportunity to write practice exams that simulate each of the three days of the CP. So you write a certain number of day one exam, a certain number of day two, and a certain number of day three. And uh, they're also trying to continue the development of what they call integration of technical competency. I'll explain what that means. They're not teaching you technical, but, but, they're te but what you're doing as you write cases is you're having the opportunity to take the technical knowledge you already have and apply it to CP type cases. So it's, when they talk about integration of technical competencies, they're talking about applying technical knowledge to CP cases. And again, as I mentioned before, there's no exam, everybody passes. Similar to the case of Capstone 1, you start with a two-day workshop, typically a Saturday, Sunday, because they realize people are working, so they don't want you to have to take any time out of your normal work schedule. And again, they spend a bit of time during those two days teaching you how to debrief uh, a case, teaching you a little bit about how to write a case. You would write a practice case before you even got there, which they would go over. And then over the course of seven weeks, you'll be writing a number of cases. What they did last year was they had the students write the three previous CPs, each of the days of the pre previous three CPs, which were marked and returned to the students. So that's why I was saying earlier, it's an opportunity to write some practice cases and get feedback. It would be, quite frankly, I think it would be silly to, turn, to not take up the opportunity. Any questions on Capstone 2? Okay, Capstone 3. I mean, CP. There is no Capstone 3. CP. Okay, the CP is three days long. Day one, as I mentioned earlier, is one big four hour case based on the module, the Capstone 1 module that you were working on from May to July. So, what you would have been doing in the Capstone module is you'll be working on a, on a case based on a particular company that's facing certain strategic cha uh, challenges. What they would do on day one of the CP is present to you the same company, but now they're dealing with new challenges that you have to deal with. Day two is what they call the roll comp. Yes. So, so if someone doesn't write Capstone 1 and comes up with CFP3 day one for the exam, it's, that's why, we're, that's why CPA Canada encourages you to do it. Because if you don't write it, I believe CPA Canada will give the case to you, but there's no way you'll have as intensive a knowledge of it as somebody who spent the last seven weeks working on it. So they'll give you a copy of the case, but you'll, I think you would be at it somewhat of a disadvantage. Then you've got day two. Day two is the roll comp. I'll explain more about that in a moment. But basically, it's one big five-hour case but not everybody is writing the same case. You choose a particular role, which I'll explain in more detail in just a moment, and the role that you choose dictates the nature of the case that you write. And I'll explain a bit more in just when I get to the next slide. And then finally, you've got day three of the CP, where you're writing what's called multis. Multis are cases that are normally from six, either anywhere from 60 to 90 minutes, most likely somewhere between 70 and 90. <coughs> Each multi will test a number of competencies. A typical multi will test anywhere from four to five competencies, and I've listed what the competencies are here. So each multi will test four to five of these competencies. Typically, a day three exam will have three, three such multis, and they will add up 240 minutes to four hours. So you'll typically have three cases adding up to four hours. So it could be three cases that are each 80 minutes, or one could be 90 and one could be 70, but it has to add up to 240 minutes. And these are the competencies that would be tested on day three. Now, you were over the course of day two and sorry, 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 sure, sure, by all means. But, but uh, those competencies, uh, do you have to cover everything, or it's up to you? For example, if someone is not interested in order and insurance, sure, can that person skip? No, that or that's a good. It's a very good question. Um, basically, it all depends on what day of the CP we're talking about. 
On day three of the CIPI, what they're going to do is they're going to give you in all likelihood three cases. And each of the cases will likely test four to five, four to six of the four or five of these six competencies. So over the courses of over the course of the whole day three, all six competencies will be tested. So you cannot come into this exam knowing nothing about any of these six competencies. The only thing is the level of depth at which you need to know things will vary, as I'll explain in a moment, depending on choices that you make. So everybody has to have a basic knowledge of all six competencies, but not necessarily an in-depth knowledge. And that's what I'm going to get to on this slide right here. Basically, on the CP, you are expected to achieve depth in only two areas. And for all other areas, your level of knowledge would be much more limited. You'd only need to achieve breadth. Now, what CPA Canada, in case anybody's wondering what depth versus breadth means, CPA Canada comes out with something called a competency map. And the competency map will tell you in a fair amount of detail what depth versus breadth means for each of the competencies. So you'll have a pretty good idea of the level of knowledge required depending on whether you've chosen breadth or depth for a particular competency. Now, if you want to get your public accountant's license, the two areas that you need to know at a high level, by depth I mean you need to know it at a very high level, you need to have strong technical in both financial accounting or financial reporting, that's one of the competencies, and assurance in order to get your public accountant's license. So to get your CPA, you don't necessarily need to get depth in these two areas, but if you want to get your CPA plus your public accountant's license, you would have to get depth in these two areas. Otherwise, you can pass the CPA by either getting depth in financial reporting, which is the same thing as financial accounting, or management accounting. So either would be good enough. So you can either come into the exam knowing management accounting at a very high level or financial accounting. I always recommend to students that they try to get depth in both because at the end of the day, um, it's, you want to hedge your bets. If you come into the exam only knowing one of these areas well, and then you don't get depth in that area, you're finished. Basically, you're not going to pass. So most of our students pretty much get depth in both. That's what we found to be the case. We, we encourage that. Then on top of that, you need to get depth. If you don't care about your public accountant's license, you just need to get depth in any of these four areas, assurance, taxation, performance management, or finance. So it's only those who want the public accountant's license who need to get depth in financial reporting and assurance. Otherwise, there's a lot more flexibility. Now, you do not make any choice before the CP between management accounting and financial accounting. Everybody, it basically, you, 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 when you write the exam, you try to get as much depth as you can in both. And as I said before, many students will get depth in both, but as long as you get depth in one, you pass the exam. However, where you do make a choice is the following. I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation that the day two comp, which is a five hour comp, there, it's called the roll comp. The reason why it's called the roll comp is you would actually choose a depth area before you even enter the CP. So I would say to CPA Canada, before I even start, before I read, when I, before I do my CP, I want my depth area to be assurance, taxation, performance management, or finance. Depending on the depth area that I choose, that will determine the content of my comp, my roll comp. The way a roll comp looks is as follows. It's one big case. However, there are two, two potential common competencies that everybody would have to address regardless of their role. You could be asked to address financial accounting, you could be asked to address management accounting, or you could be asked to address both. The financial accounting and management accounting will be the same for all students, regardless of their role. Then, the remainder of the requirements that you have to deal with, the remainder of the requirements you need to address, will relate to your role. So let's say I choose assurance as my role. I will be, 
I will need to deal with financial accounting and or management accounting. They can either test financial, management, or both. And then I will also need to answer a number of requires relating specifically to my competency. So if I've chosen assurance, I will have numerous requires relating to assurance. If I've chosen taxation, I'll have numerous requires relating to taxation. Now, because the requires that you need to address will differ depending on the role you've chosen, not everybody has the same content in their exam. The way it works is as follows. You get a big exam, you'll have a number of appendices that everybody has to read, okay? And it's in those appendices that you'll have most of the information relating to financial accounting and or management accounting. And then you'll have a special appendix for your specific role. So there'll be one appendix that only deals with assurance, another that only deals with taxation, another that only deals with performance management, and another that only deals with finance. You will only read the appendix that relates to your role. So if I've chosen assurance as my role, I would read the common appendices that everybody has to read, and then I will read the appendix for assurance. If I've chosen tax as my role, I'll read the common information, the common appendices, plus the taxation appendix. So not everybody is writing the same exam when it comes to the role comp. Is that clear to everybody? Yep. The maximum number of competencies that you would have to address on the comp is really three, because there'll be financial accounting and or management accounting, plus whatever of the four competencies you've chosen as your role. So it'll either be two or three competencies, nothing more. So, it would be, so if I've chosen assurance as my role, I'm not gonna see any finance on my roll comp, I'm not gonna see any tax, etc. Is that clear to everybody? And that basically, in a nutshell, is what the CP looks like. Yes? So uh, we have to choose two competencies, basically. Well, you only, as I was saying before, when it comes to, you have to get depth in two areas. Management accounting and, or, or financial accounting, and then one of the other four. But for financial accounting and management accounting, you don't make a choice beforehand. Because everybody is writing, everybody has to write, has to address the same requires for management accounting and financial accounting, regardless of the role you're playing. So you don't need to make a choice in advance between management and financial accounting. The only choice you have to make is whether you'd like to choose assurance, taxation, performance management, or finance. There you have to make a choice because that will affect the content of your comp, of your role comp. So if I choose management accounting and assurance, but I still have to study financial accounting? Yes, because at the end of the day, the only requires that are specific to your role are on day two, and that would only be for assurance, taxation, performance management, and finance. Everybody addresses the same requires for financial accounting and management accounting. That's why I recommended earlier that I would come into the exam being strong of both because it's very dangerous to only be strong at one, because then if you don't make it, you don't have a fallback. So most of our students prepare very well for both. Many of them end up getting depth in both, but this way, if one doesn't work out, hopefully the other does. Yes, please. What is the requirement if uh, currently I'm not looking for the public accounting license, but maybe at, at a later stage? Oh, the good news is, if you're not sure you want your public accountant's license, you can choose other competencies other than assurance, and now they've developed something called a PDPA exam, which is a bridging exam that you can write post-CPA um, that would allow you to then get your public accountant's license. It's a separate exam that you would write after your CPA. But quite honestly, if you think you want your public accountant's license, I think Ira will agree with me, we would strongly recommend that you choose assurance as your role so you don't have to write another exam. You know, and also, correct me if I'm wrong, I mean, Given that you've already written a CA in Pakistan, you should be well prepared in assurance, because that's a big focus, is it not, of the exam you've written. So it's not like you're not prepared for it. Do you see what I mean? And assurance, is not, assurance although there are differences, I'm sure there's a huge amount of similarity between assurance here and in, and in Pakistan. There has to be. Procedures are procedures. Risk is risk. Materiality is materiality. Yeah. Yes. So I have a couple of questions. Uh, question number one is, uh, what would be the uh, textbook or what would be the material? Because in Pakistan, we are more focused on theoretical or academic. So these seems to be case studies. So that's number one question. Uh, number two question is, how much time will it take to uh, prepare for these three uh, days? And question number three is, what is the difference between CPA, CA, and just CPA? 
Uh, okay, well, let's start with the, fir the first question. Your first question was the material, right? CPA Canada is not going to give you a huge amount of material. They do have an Oracle website. They, uh, through Oracle, there's all sorts of tech 